Hi, good morning. Today we are going to talk on sandwich lemma and a couple of applications. Sandwich lemma is one of the most important thing to establish a convergence of a sequence to a number of our, which we guess as the limit. Okay. And before going, I would like you to read the disclaimer and agree with it, then go ahead. Okay, let's go. So today's lecture is on sandwich lemma. Sandwich lemma. So let us just imagine something. Suppose you are in a room and there is only one gate. Okay. And there is a lot of, all of a sudden there is a fire alarm. Okay. There are a lot of people. It's full of people. Now notice that this fellow is a fireman. Okay. He wants to go reach the fire extinguisher. It may be here. right near the corner of the room right but people in front of him and and people behind him okay all of them want to rush to the exit what do you think will happen to this fireman okay just imagine it's fully crowded, okay? Not the way I had done, but it's a full of crowd and everybody wants to escape. And this guy's sandwich are squeezed in between people who are get, trying to get out and people who are behind him also want to get out. Okay, that's what sandwich lemma says. Can you guess? He will also be out. This happens, for example, in Mumbai local train, the other is one of the busiest stations. If you are a newcomer to Mumbai, if you stand somewhere near the exit door, 
people who in front of you want to get out and people who are in the compartment also will rush to get out and you will also be carried out to the platform believe me this really happens okay anyway come back to mathematics what does it say suppose i have a sequence of real numbers a n and a sequence of real numbers b n and further assume a n converges to l and b n also converges to l okay and let's assume another sequence x n which is sandwiched between these two sequences what does it mean for every n we have a n is less than or equal to x n which is less than or equal to b n then i say x n is sandwiched between the sequence a n and b n okay now a n is rushing to l b n is also rushing to l and x n is squeezed or sandwiched in between a n and b n so what do i expect i expect x n also converge to l that's what the sandwich theorem says okay so theorem let okay limit of a n equal to l which is also limit of b n okay assume that yes x n is such that a sequence x n is such that a n is less than equal to x n less than equal to b n for all n natural number then x n also converges to This is the theorem we want to prove. The proof is very simple. What all I have to do is to draw picture and understand what is going to happen. Suppose this is so. To prove that x and converge to L, okay, you are going to give me an epsilon positive. So let me form the interval L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. All right? Okay. Now, since x a n converges to L, what do I know? I know there exists an n1 so that if k is greater than or equal to n1, my a k will lie here, right? K greater than or equal to n1 should imply a k should be somewhere here in this interval. And similarly, since b n converges to L, I know there exists an n2 so that for k greater than or equal to n2. My B K will lie somewhere here in the interval, right? Now notice that what's the relation between A K and B K? Right. So if I choose n to be the maximum of n one and n two, and K to be greater than equal to n, then A K will lie here and B K will also lie here, and just because A K Is less than or equal to B K, so I can draw a picture like this. So this is for K greater than or equal to maximum of both n one and n two. Call it n. Okay. Now what was our hypothesis? Our hypothesis was for all K, A K less than or equal to X K less than or equal to B K. That means. For all k greater than equal to n, in particular, this is true for all k, but this is in particular for k greater than equal to n. My x k should lie somewhere here. So what does that mean? It says that for all k greater than equal to n, my x k lies in the interval l minus epsilon to l plus epsilon. That is same as saying x k, the sequence x k converges to n. Okay, spend a couple of minutes. We will. I will just with the minimal writing. I will give a proof. But this is the this all it is. Very simple theorem. Okay. So how do I write a textbook proof for this? Okay. Since x n sorry a n converges to L. There is n one such that for all k greater than or equal to n one, x a k lies in the interval 
L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. This is the first. And similarly, since B n converges to L, there is n to so that my B k lies in the interval L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. Right. So let n equal to maximum of n one and n two. Then if k is greater than equal to n, what do we have? I have a L minus epsilon is less than a k. That's less than equal to b k, but that's less than L plus epsilon. Do you understand that? Yes, because a k and b k lie in the interval L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. Therefore, I get this. By hypothesis, for all k, a k is less than equal to x k, less than equal to b k. Therefore, for k greater than equal to n, we have L minus epsilon is less than a k. Which is less than or equal to x k, which is less than or equal to b k, which is less than l plus epsilon. That implies for all k greater than or equal to n, l minus epsilon is less than x k, which is less than l plus epsilon. Hence, x k converges to l. Is the proof clear? Okay. Pause the video, review this argument, and then proceed. Now we shall give some simple applications. The first application, I will give two theoretical application, and the third one, some kind of uh, concrete applications. Okay, practical. Okay, but these are all very important. Okay, right. Okay. Now let us look at application one. Our example. So all of you know. What is meant by alpha being the LUB of A? So what does it mean? A real number alpha is the LUB of A if alpha is an upper bound of A, and if beta is an upper bound of A, then alpha is less than or equal to beta. In particular. In particular, if beta is less than alpha, then beta is not an upper bound. That means there exists an x in A such that x strictly greater than beta. Of course, it will be less than or equal to alpha because alpha is an upper bound. Is that okay? So. One of the ways of exploiting the LUB property, if I want to get a sequence, is to consider something like this. Suppose alpha is the least upper bound of A. Look at alpha minus one by n. Fix a natural number n. Look at alpha minus one by n. This is strictly less than alpha. Therefore, this is not an upper bound of the set A. Right? Therefore, what do I know? There is an x in A which will be greater than alpha minus one by n, right? So since this x might depend upon n, so let me call it there exists x n in A such so that alpha minus one by n is strictly less than alpha. Sorry, alpha minus one by n strictly less than x n. But x n is an element of A, and what's a little Relation between x n and alpha. X n must be less than or equal to alpha. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Now, what do I know about x n? X n is a sequence in A. Now, 
because all elements are in A. Now I have a sequence. Now let's look at I have it is sandwiched between two sequences. What are the two sequences? This is the constant sequence alpha, and this is the sequence alpha minus one by n. Right? So this is my like A n and this is like me B n. So where does this converge? This sequence converges to alpha. This sequence, of course, converges to alpha. Therefore, what do I conclude? Therefore, I conclude the sequence X n converges to alpha. So, what have what have we proved? We have proved that if alpha is the least upper bound of A, then I can find the sequence X n in A which converges to the least upper bound alpha. Therefore, this is what we conclude. This will be very useful if you go along, if you go further in mathematics. So, pause, review, and then proceed. The next one is something to do with the density of rationals and irrationals. I am sure all of you have learned it. What is the density of rationals? In R, it says that if you give me any interval A, B, well, that is given any A less than B in R, okay? I, there, there exists always a rational number R in Q such that R belong to A, B, which is same as saying A less than R less than B. R, in other words, the interval A, B intersect with Q is not empty. That means given any open interval, I can always find a rational number in this, in that interval, okay? Now I want to make use of that. What I want to claim is give me, let alpha be a real number. Then I want to say there exists a sequence Rn of rational numbers such so that Rn converges to alpha. What does this mean? Any real number at alpha can be approximated by a rational number. That's what it says. Because, because that's a reason for sequences. When I say R and converges to alpha, what does it mean? If n is very large, R and will be close to alpha. That is, you give me any level of error allowed, then if I choose n large enough, then alpha minus R R n will be less than epsilon. That means R n is very close to alpha. Okay. Any real number can be approximated by a rational number to the level of accuracy you want. This is what the theorem says. Do you understand this? Okay. Now let's go back. I want to prove that. So the first thing you should notice is given any real number, I can always find a sequence of real numbers which converge to that. How do I do that? So let us look at the interval alpha minus one by n, alpha plus one by n. All right. Notice that it may happen alpha minus one by n may be greater than alpha plus one by n. Do you understand this? It might happen. Yeah, because if alpha, let us say, n equal to 10, my alpha is 1 by 20, <coughs> sorry, I am really sorry, I am making a stupid statement, I 
I was confusing with something else. Okay. Notice that alpha minus 1 by n is less than alpha plus 1 by n. Right? Okay. By the density of rational, therefore I know there is a rational number Rn, which is in this interval. Yeah? Very good. Now, I have a sequence of rational numbers Rn. What do I know about this? I have alpha minus 1 by n is less than Rn, which is less than alpha plus 1 by n. Because Rn lies in this interval. Right? Now, you see that this sequence of rational numbers Rn is sandwiched between, between these two sequences. Now, where does this sequence converge to? It converges to alpha. This also converges to alpha. Therefore, this fellow is forced to converge to alpha by sandwich lemma. So, we have proved this theorem. What is the theorem? Given any real number alpha, I can find a sequence of rational numbers which converge to alpha. Is it okay? Okay. Now let's go to the next application. The next application deals with the following. Suppose I have two positive real numbers such that A is less than or equal to B. Yeah? Then I want to look at An plus Bn a power n plus b power n and take its nth root 1 by n. This is my sequence xn. So I have a new sequence like this. Right? I want to know the limit of xn. Well, where does it converge to? Okay. I'm going to make use of some results you might have already learn. Okay. If you have not learned, this is an opportunity to go back and review it. Maybe I'll produce another video. What I call a some, some important limits, I will do that. But at present, I will say what I want, we will use it. Okay. What we know is that this is a known fact. If alpha is any positive real number, then let us look at the sequence alpha to the power 1 by n, it always converges to 1. This is a fact. Okay, we are going to assume this and use this. Okay, now let us look at how to use this. Now, the first thing you should notice is what is I want to estimate. So, I want to put this xn, I sandwich between two things. But is there a guess? Then I would, so you understand what I mean? If I want to show, if I know xn, I want to say if it converges to L, one trick is to find an and bn, both should converge to L, and my xn is sandwiched between an and bn. This is what I want to do. You follow that? So the first thing is I should find a guess for L, and perhaps an and bn also. Right, nothing is clear. We just have to try. Okay, let's try. Now, what is the estimate I can do? Since a is less than b, then a power n will be less than b power n. In fact, 
if you want you can even write leather i equal to i don't care okay right therefore a power n plus b power n will be less than equal to 2 times b power n and notice that it's also greater than equal to b power n do you understand this now do you see a proof yeah right now take its nth power so b n to the power 1 by n will be less than equal to a power n plus b power n it's the power 1 by n that is n root of this less than equal to 2 power 1 by n and b power n by n 1 by n yeah right now what do i know about this this is just b and this is 2 power 1 by n times b right now let's look at the known fact tells me alpha is positive then alpha to the power 1 by n goes to 1 therefore 2 to the power 1 by n where does it go to it goes to 1 next by algebra conversion sequences 2 to the power 1 by n sequence converges to 1 this is a constant sequence b converges to 1 therefore the product sequence converges to b so this sequence converges to b this is constant sequence b and my original sequence is sandwiched between these two sequences right so uh, therefore what do i conclude therefore i conclude a to the power n plus b to the power n 1 by n converges to b that is same as maximum of a and b okay this is a typical way you use this sandwich lemma okay just before i go there is still about 5 minutes time or something so we used another fact what are the fact i used okay we used the following fact it's a good to know now forget this a and b you can think of this different a suppose zero is less than a less than b if and only if for every natural number n a power n is less than or equal to b power n in okay in particular in particular if i have a to the power 1 by n right is less than b to the power 1 by n if and only if a is less than b do you understand that with the same assumption then i know the nth root of a exists the nth root of b exists okay then i am claim a is less than or equal to b if and only if nth root of a is less than or equal to nth root of b where do you for where does it follow because you you can raise it if i raise it to the power n this is what i get okay if you don't don't want think of it as s and t then s is less than t if and only if s power n is less than equal to t power n these are we want are you do you understand okay this follows by a very simple thing if i have if i want to show b power n is greater than a a power n what do i have to prove i have to show b power n minus a power n is positive now just to exercise your memory the moment i see b power n minus a power n what will i use if n equal to 2 it is b squared minus a squared therefore i can take it as b minus a into b plus a right now let us assume b is greater than a then b minus a is positive and you told me a is positive therefore b plus a is also positive therefore this is product of two no positive numbers and therefore this is positive yeah 
Conversely, suppose this is positive. Since you already told me A and B are positive, this is positive. The product therefore must be positive. That means this term B minus A must be positive. That is B is greater than A. Yeah. Similarly, B cubed minus A cubed. So let us do the general case. So you can check this identity. It is B minus A into B to the power N minus 1 plus B to the power N minus 2A plus B into A to the power N minus 2 plus A to the power N minus 1. Okay, check this. Now, whatever argument I gave is applicable here. Why? Suppose B is greater than A, that means this is positive. And now these are all positive numbers. Therefore, this, two, this is the product of two positive numbers. That means B power N minus A power N is positive. That means B power N is strictly greater than A power N. Conversely, if this is positive, since it's given A and B are positive, this term is positive. And the product of these two terms is positive. Therefore, this term must be positive. Exactly similar to this proof. Okay. The important thing is many times you will need this. A is less than B implies as these are all positive numbers. Okay. This is the standing hypothesis. Okay. A and B are positive numbers. Or at least non-negative. This is the standing hypothesis. Okay. Then a is less than b if and only a to the power 1 by n is less than b to the power 1 by n. Okay. Or the other way around. Okay. A is less than b if and only a to the power n is less than equal to b to 1. Okay. So with this I will stop. I hope all of you enjoyed this lecture. Please pause. Review. Okay. Then once again, review the entire thing. Okay. Thank you very much for patiently listening to me. Have a good day.